Hello and welcome to week six of LET 2150. Uh, again, my name is Todd Hurley. I'm your instructor for the class. Um, this week we're going to cover one chapter. It is chapter eight uh, in Raymond Foster's uh, police technology book under agency systems. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it this week. Um, we'll start here by um, going through the first couple slides here relatively quickly. The um, Chapter 8 again in, in the Police Technology book by Raymond Nee Foster. Um, you know, the assignments, the assignments are on the assignments on Blackboard. Um, each week I try to you know, keep each week separate so you know what you, you have responsible for each week. Um, should be an uh, old hat at that by now. Um, assignments, you know, the two opposing faces uh, um, indicate uh, the discussion board topic for the week. Um, this week we have one discussion board, and this one, on this week's discussion board, it's, it's this one is one of my favorite ones, and I'm thinking about trying to offer some sort of bonus to somebody who really comes up with the right answer, the correct answer here, because um, there's it's uh, a little bit deeper than just uh, what it is. It looks at uh, looks like from um, uh, the service here. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. The learning objectives for this week's uh, class are. Um, the reason good records uh, keeping is so critical to law enforcement. Um, operator security, the right to know versus the need to know. You know, you may think you have the right to know something, but do you need to know? Uh, right to know is a, a position or a, a, a function based, whereas need to know is situational, situational based. And purpose of records management systems, RMS systems, JMS systems, uh, EMS systems. Uh, jail management, evidence management systems. We'll we'll kind of hit on those all of, uh, all of those systems real briefly. Um, and then the last thing is the impact of the Freedom of Information Act on, on police records, <clears throat> and what um, those those uh, that Freedom of Information Act uh, applies to. Police records. Uh, information retained by police agency runs the spectrum from crime reports to personnel reports. So there is a big gamut of information that police departments deal with on a daily basis. And so there is a big, um, uh, vast spectrum of things that, that, that fit those category. Um, so information is need, uh, but it's important that the, the, that information be readily available, uh, kept for a long time, and Clearly, one of the most important is, is held confidentially. Um, records keeping systems. Um, police agencies create a lot of paper. Uh, automated records keeping uh, systems um, are a combination of hardware, software, uh, policies, and procedures. So, you know, despite the desire to be completely paperless, most uh, most police departments still have a hybrid of information kept in a records management system. Um, and also kept in paper and, and some of that stuff uh, information just can't be uh, put into those records management systems. So there's, 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 a, there's a mixture of those um, types of systems. Uh, recording uh, keep, excuse me, wow, record keeping systems. Uh, there are two types of record keeping systems, first tier and second tier. First tier uh, manufacturers are, are large companies they are set up to produce quality, uh, custom designed software and hardware configurations. Um, you know, a lot of times that's the challenge uh, between you know buying a first tier, and second tier system is one is is obviously the money that's involved, but um, you know, getting into the first tier manufacturers of these large companies, um, they tend to be very pricey. But the advantage is is that it's custom designed software specifically for your agency and specifically for your processes and procedures. Again, uh, second tier manufacturers may be large companies, but the products are off the shelf. So you're, you're, you kind of you buy something off the shelf, and you kind of have to adapt your pro, um, your procedures, your policies to fit those um, fit those types of um, systems. Um, the result is many of these systems are incompatible. Uh, smaller agencies do not gain the expertise that larger agencies have, and that's clearly about dollars and cents and money. Um, one of the, the the key things there is that smaller agencies, their budgets are limited, so they're they're kind of forced into a lot of times tier two solutions, the off the off the shelf solutions, and with that, they you know a lot of their information will get compartmentalized. You know, my my evidence management system will talk to my um, records management system, which won't talk to the um, you know maybe the the video system for my cruiser videos. So it, it's there is a thing and. 
that leads to what? Fragmentation, and um, the resulting the result of that is that effect continues to grow. So you know it's hard to get everything into one system. So when you look at one uh, one one record, one person, one car, whatever it might be, that all that information is handy. Um, criminal justice versus police records. Um, criminal justice includes every piece of information gathered to be used in the criminal justice system. Um, a fully get, and then versus police records, a fully integrated. Uh, Police records management system is going to have access to all of the records maintained by different criminal justice organizations. So, this diagram here is a good diagram. It kind of, you know, you have the police officer in the middle, and you have all these various uh, information systems uh, commercial records, NCIC, other agency vehicle records, prison records, uh, local agency records, court records, and um, probation records. So as we look at this next slide, the officer can have interaction with all of those systems, get, gather information from all of those systems, and sometimes that can be uh, mind-boggling in itself, but it can be a very uh, difficult task to, to, to do that and do that readily. There are some systems out there now um, that are really moving towards integrating a lot of these systems. You know, when you do one query on John Smith, you're going to get his um, NCIC records, his vehicle records, if he's been in prison, his prison records, probation records, court records, they'll all be linked to that. Um, there's one that we use in Central Ohio called uh, iLinks and it does a very good job at doing that as well as tying other agencies together. So there are some changes that have happened in the last few years that have really kind of made this process a little bit easier. <coughs> Excuse me. Information security and accuracy. Um, law enforcement, and this unfortunately is, a, is a, a depressing slide for me, in law enforcement when information is compromised, authorized users uh, primarily do it intentionally. In other words, uh, most security breaches that take place are not the result of hackers hacking in through um, firewalls and the things that you see on television, the things that, that appear to be uh, you know, the savvy tech person doing. It is a result of someone intentionally breaching uh, the system and, and someone um, divulging um, information that, it, that, can't, uh, that doesn't have the right to do so. Uh, information security accuracy, law enforcement personnel also have general access to a wide variety of information um, about the average person that is confidential and protected by law. So when they, there are those kinds of breaches or their information is shared that's not, you know, that can be um, something that is prohibited by law and there could be rem ramifications as a result. Generally, information is, a, is available to law enforcement users is considered privileged information for official use only. So running somebody's criminal history, some, running somebody's driving record, you know, that is considered for official use only and cannot be disseminated to the public. Um, and that really leads into the whole scenario of right to know versus need to know. Um, derived from the uh, officer's occupation, the fact that he's an officer, that he's in law enforcement, um, officers have the right to know, uh, to know certain privileged information. Again, driving uh, histories, criminal histories, those kinds of things. Um, but then derived from the situation, does, it, does, does the officer need to know this information in order to further his or her investigation? Sometimes there's a, uh, there's a balance there that you know, sometimes um, you know it, it goes too far, or sometimes you know um, they uh, uh, err on the side of caution, and that information is isn't used. Uh, training people. So the first layer of protection for all this, you know, the right to know versus need to know, and and trying to protect the information is training people to realize that they have an ethical responsibility with confidential uh, confidential information. That is key. Uh, you know, getting officers, uh, law enforcement uh, people, to understand that. Um, they have an ethical obligation or responsibility to, to keep that confidential information confidential. Having clear rules and regulations concerning the field uh, use of, of equipment, you know, having um, uh, passwords, screensavers on mobile data computers, um, using password, data logs. Um, one thing that um, has changed in the last few years, um, I believe it's DMP 2020, that's a protocol that was put in place by the state. It requires that every query of the NCIC database, um, it passes on the officer's driver's license number along with the associated query. So 
at the state level and then also logged at the local level are logs containing information that says, okay, officer so-and-so ran such and such a plate on such and such a date and time and here was the response. So there are those logs out there that, um, you know, that are being kept and that are required to be kept at, by the state and by the, uh, the federal government that forces um, that kind of information to be, to re to be retained. Um, also, there's different levels of access. Certain people have access to certain information. You know, you may have people in your agency that don't have access to uh, um, sexual, uh, sexually based crimes, uh, children, uh, juvenile based crimes. So those crimes, um, they may not have access to it. And those are just two examples. And then proper authentication. The state requires um, changing of passwords every 60 days and so um, you know all the myriad of systems that you have access to those 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 typically center around that regulation so all of them those passwords will expire and require a certain level of complexity and so forth so uh, proper authentication is key privacy issues for example the names of victims of sexual assault as I mentioned before um, failure to protect the victims can uh, result in a civil litigation um, and that has taken place I've seen a couple instances of where um, municipalities were, were sued as a result of information that wasn't kept um, in confidence. Uh, for law enforcement agencies, information about someone can be considered their personal property. Um, victims trust the agency uh, not to reveal the information, and if, if the information is revealed, uh, it could uh, cause the person to suffer uh, defamation. Um, using person's likeness and photos uh, uh, raise issues of ownership. So, the you know the real question at the core of that is you know keeping the information uh, um, confidential. Uh, any uh, unauthorized uh, release of that information caught, could there could be ramifications to that. Um, to balance that, and you you know the balance is to you know to keep the the public confidence. You know being able to solve crimes. You know really get at the core of 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 law enforcement. Um, the times in which law enforcement agencies are prevented from uh, intercepting communications by private systems. Um, fulfill uh, a, a citizen's demand to know what information the government has obtained and, and, and there uh, kind of crops up the next word, the Freedom of Information Act. Governments take a uh, uh, of acts to inform people uh, of information. Turning data into information. Um, data, you know, and, you know, there is a master file cross-reference with numbers. Um, it's indexed. Um, now that all that master file and that and, and that type of filing system of the, the old is now being done in databases, and it's really evolved into relational relational databases. Uh, relational databases are um, databases that have multiple relations between tables. You know, there may be a table of a uh, an, a person table, then Based on, you know, if they were involved in an incident, there is a link to the incident table, uh, an arrest table. So those are relationship, uh, relational databases that are, are related by common fields. Um, and they can also be linked to external sources. So um, records management systems, um, there are several small systems like uh, CAD and, and, and RMS. The records management, system, records management system uh, is a system that... Um, Exchange informations, um, you know, with you know, or is the, the warehouse of information um, for all the records that's contained within it, within an agency, um, and you may only you know the the thing about a records management system is you know you may um, only have the ability to ask questions of certain parts uh, or dig into certain parts of those records management systems or those specific database systems. Um, the jail management system. A jail management system you know, is pretty straightforward. It contains you know, information about inmate status, uh, photographs, fingerprints, uh, visitation records, special needs, um, you know, any scars, marks, tattoos. You know, there's a lot of information, medical records, medical histories, um, you know, just some of the information that you know, uh, a jail system is going to use to process prisoners. And then you have the evidence man management system. An evidence management system is key in that um, it documents the chain of custody um, and it assists in orderly transfer of evidence from labs and courts. So um, you typically you have a property room clerk that manages those systems 
um, when evidence needs to be taken out of the property room uh, after it's checked in, when uh, it's inventoried at the night of the incident or whatever. Um, uh, evidence may be checked out to a lab for testing. Um, samples may be sent to a lab for uh, uh, analysis. Um, and it really, um, the evidence management system, um, and it can be part of your records management system, can assist for the proper storage of evidence and the proper processing of evidence and to maintain the proper uh, chain of custody. And then you have case management systems. Um, case management systems are systems that are set up so that um, it, it assists detectives and detective supervisors for managing caseloads. Um, and based on the type of case, number of cases, um, and the solvability of the case, as well as the, solve, the, the performance of the particular detective, that a lot, all those systems will take in that into consideration and help uh, supervisors um, uh, assign cases on a, on a, on a uh, priority basis. And there are many different uses of police data. So you know, here we're we're showing some of those screens that talk about you know a daily log report, personnel roster. Um, field uh, interviews, FI cards in the bottom left-hand corner, as well as uh, monthly return of offense known to uh, police, so statistical information. So um, there's a many different uses of police data. So, um, And the many different uses of that data can lead to uh, a strategic purpose. You know, as we learned um, in the last recent chapters, strategic information versus tactical information. Strategic information is used to help deployment. It helps. It's helped. It's used in an analysis. So it's really about manpower, um, better uh, shifting resources to better solve crime. And um, there are two types of inquiries that that can be used of this information. Um, one is a conditional information and an ad hoc query. So. Um, a conditional query is, you know, I want to know something what happened when and here and, and a specific uh, set of parameters, whereas ad hoc will be more, um, it, you know, on the fly. I want to know the number of red hat people that um, walked into a store, you know, and uh, performed this crime. The next system that we want to talk about is new mobile office systems or mobile systems that are in police cruisers. Um, this has really changed, and some of the pictures here are even dated from what uh, you see here. Um, the mobile office consists of a vehicle, the mobile radio system, and mobile data computer. And now there are even more systems added on that. You have a radar system, you will have a license plate reader system, and you can have um, uh, an in-car video system. So there's a lot more that's be than it's being shown in this particular picture. Um, here's one uh, that shows a touch space screen. You'll see that the keyboard right underneath that. Um, two different radios in this particular um, or, um, car. Actually, the, the second thing down below the keyboard there is the light bar um, siren control, um, then multiple radios there. Um, one probably is the local agency radio, and then the, the one below that may be a state radio. Um, so the new mobile office also, also gives officers the, the ability to access mug shots, fingerprint information, GIS data, aerial photographs. Um, the challenges really are the, the data bandwidth to the vehicles. Um, but w that's been enhanced in recent years. 4G technology has really enabled a little bit more uh, flow of information from the vehicles to the car. Um, like a desktop PC, the mobile office has a computer CPU usually, uh, usually mounted in the trunk of the car. This is really only a half Tr uh, trunk tray. Most cars now, even the new police interceptors, will have full trunk uh, trays, uh, full cabinets that um, are full there. One thing to, you know, I always tell um, people that we purchase uh, vehicles, uh, police vehicles off the state term pricing, and it's roughly about $25,000 a vehicle. We will put $25,000 and more back into the car in terms of radio system, police, uh, or excuse me, um, PC, um, mobile uh, mobile computers, um, license plate readers, uh, video systems, and that. And so when it's all said and done, the light controls and everything that's involved in a car, you know, will be about fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars. So there's a lot more cost to a car than just the cost of the car. Um, image processing, documents, photographs, fingerprints, crime scene photographs. They can be scanned, digitized, and stored in a database. And so, again, having that, um, the ability to do that, to digitize information uh, stored in digital format, allows for information to be tied together in these relational, relational databases. Okay. 
now we're at the end here, and and this is again, this is probably uh, one among the one or two or three of, of my favorite discussion boards. There is a really a right or wrong answer to this one. Yeah, you know, I know that I say I typically don't do that, but um, you know, I, as you can see, if you do your responses, you do your 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 post, and you respond to other people's posts, you're going to get the, the the points on the thing. What I really want you to think about is based on your knowledge of the Freedom of Information Act and who the Freedom of Information Act applies to. That's the key, and I'll, I, I will give you no more than that. Go to the discussion board and post your responses to the following. Are Attorney General Mike DeWine's emails um, to a scheduler public information? Why or why not? As an advocate for releasing public information, why would he not want to release these emails? Give some examples to support your opinion, um, and then uh, I don't know why this is always the post is always shorter than most. Um, you know, you 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 take as much as you'd like, but answer the question here based on the Freedom of Information Act. So, if anybody gets this correct, you know, I, I, you will definitely earn some points with me, and uh, I, I will be a lot lenient in uh, some of your grading of other assignments. So. Um, that's it for today. Um, you know, and this is chapter eight. So just remember that um, you know, um, get your discussion boards. This is going to be a lighter week. Next week we'll have review for the midterm. So um, I will be posting out here in the next uh, few days the um, midterm study guide. Um, I will tell you in this video, and I will tell you in, again in other videos on prep for that. If you download the, the the midterm study guide and go through and answer each of the questions that are in there and take the time to do that, that will be a very key thing to do to having very good success on the midterm. So I don't know how to spell out it anymore that some of those questions will be the exact questions that you'll see on the midterm. So if you do that, have that handy when you take the test, you will find that your test will go very smoothly. So I think that's it for this week. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, hit up the, the information section on Blackboard. All my information's there. And I hope you have a good week, and we'll talk to you soon.